My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Sunday, November 20th, 2016. I'm here with Richard Siegel in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Rich, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement in Chavarat Shalom, and subsequently in the New York Chavarat, and the impact that the Chavara has had on your own life and on American Jewry more broadly. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you first got involved in the Chavara. So let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, uh, you were born um, in what year and where? I was born in 1947 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so tell me briefly about your family when you were growing up. I was the third of um, three sons. Um, my parents were uh, born in America to both their parents were uh, the immigrant generation. They were both born in Pittsburgh as well. Um, they came from what they would say were Orthodox families um, I'm not sure really what that means in today's jargon, but um, but they, uh, my grandparents were more observant in general. My grandfather on my father's side was um, basically the founder of almost every Orthodox synagogue in Pittsburgh at the time. Um, what, did, what did your parents do for a living? My parents, um, my, my father was a jeweler uh, and a, um, they had a, they had a, a, a store um, which was Siegel's Jewelers and Appliances. Um, it's a kind of combination that you don't see much today. They sold everything from diamond wedding rings to clock radios. You know, so it was... Um, and watches, right? And watches, yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as they expanded, the one part of the store was the jewelry and, and watches, and then there was a, another part of the store where they sold dishes and silverware and radios and... And then there was another part of the store that was my uncle's optometry shop because optometry was a division of jewelry at the time. You would go in and you would put on different glasses until you found ones that worked for you and then that was your, um, that was your eye exam as it were and then it became, optometry became a more, um, more of a profession, and then, so that was. Uh, but my fa my grandfather had started the, the store. He came over as a watchmaker, and he started a little, had a little watchmaking shop, and then it eventually went from watchmaking to jewelry. And then, my father dropped out of school in the ninth grade to go work for my my uh, my grandfather and uh, and they built it into a fairly significant small business as it were and your mom you described as a renaissance woman if I put it that yeah way. yeah she was um, professionally she was a she began as a teacher um, and uh, when I was in high school, she went back to school. She went to, to Pitt and got a master's in um, um, so reading. You said? In, in, she became a reading specialist, but but her master's was in in educational testing. Um, uh, but then she became a reading specialist, and a, and also she conducted um, educational tests, whether it was the uh, IQ tests or the cuter preference exams and yeah. <laughs> things like that. But she, when she stopped working, um, she was um, she, uh, 
she took up a number of different pursuits. So for, throughout her life, she played piano um, as an avocation, but she was pretty good at it. But sequentially, she did crocheting, she did weaving, she did macrame, um, she did jewelry making for a small amount of it. And some of it was quite complicated and sophisticated and one of my regrets is I haven't, I don't have any of her macrame. She became a, she did quite lovely, she did the whole backdrop of my father's store in macrame and, uh, and the, um, the arc for the, um, the boss in Chavara, she did, uh, she, she did the macrame cover for the, Many people have for the front. Many people have commented on that and remembered that, that it was yeah, your mother who yeah, did it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about where you lived when you were growing up. What part of Pittsburgh were you, was your family in? Uh, I grew up in Squirrel Hill, which was and remarkably still is a very Jewish neighborhood. Um, it's one of the most, I believe from what I understand, one of the most stable Jewish neighborhoods um, in, in the country in the sense that once the Jewish community moved in there, it's pretty much stayed, um, stayed in there. And it's a significant portion of the population, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good good size. But uh, you know, Murray Avenue had the bagel store and the deli shops and the Weinstein's restaurant and um, kosher bakeries and the Pinsker's religious shop where you got your kipot and kalesim and. And wine, that was the other thing. Pit Pittsburgh, Pen Pennsylvania, I think, still is a state controlled liquor state. So um, you had to go to a state store to buy any alcohol, but you could buy kosher wine at Pinsker's because it was kind of a religious um, uh, sacrament uh, kind of thing. So um, Squirrel Hill was a kind of an upper middle class community. Um, I, um, Would you describe your family as upper middle class? I would, I would say so. They, they um, it, it, again, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, to say. I mean, there were, um, um, yeah, I, I, I think basically you, you, we, we would have to say that. Um, we had a, a very nice house. We had a car. We, had, we didn't belong to the country club. Both my uncles belonged to the country club, but that wasn't really of much interest to my parents. But uh, yeah, so we, and we never, you know, I was able to go to summer camps and college and that. Yeah. <laughs> so. so what was the Jewish community like in, in, in this part of Pittsburgh and, and more about your own uh, family's own uh, religious observance and, right. and ways of identifying Jewishly. Well, <clears throat> we were um, we were a conservative household. My, we belonged to Beth Shalom, which was the major conservative synagogue in um, in Pittsburgh, but particularly in in the Squirrel Hill area. Um, at that time. Um, I think um, well, some of the manifestations of this that are different than things might be today. I went to a I went to Hebrew school, but the Hebrew school was four days a week after school and then um, junior congregation on Saturday and Sunday school on Sunday. So I was, I was going to Hebrew school pretty much six days a week um, in one form or another. And uh, that was just what we did. I mean, that, it wasn't like a... Was that common in your community? Or was that something Well, else? it was common in the, in the kind of the group that I kind of hung out with, but... Um, my middle brother revolted against it, but I, I kind of went along. Um, I was a uh, member of 
USY, um, that was kind of our major youth group, although I also became a member of Young Judea. Um, kind of wasn't clear to me what the distinctions were so much between different kind of youth groups, but... Uh, was your family Zionistically inclined or involved? They were... Um, they were... They were engaged with Israel, but at a remove. Um, my parents never went to Israel until... Actually, I, I, when I spent some time there in college, they came over to visit. My grandparents were very involved, um, but also had never gone to Israel. Um, so I was the first member of the family to have gone to Israel. When I graduated high school, I spent the summer in kibbutz. Um, <clears throat> and it was very uh, important for my grandfather. I brought him back a little sidur, you know, with a little filigree on, on it. And it was very uh, meaningful to him. You, you described your parents as what you said was functionally, Jewishly functionally illiterate. What did you mean by that? Well, we would go to synagogue, my mother particularly, pretty much every Shabbat morning, but she didn't know any of the prayers, certainly in, in Hebrew. Um, <clears throat> my father had a passing ability to read Hebrew, but certainly was in no way Hebrew literate. Um, he always struggled to get through Kiddush, so um, but they but they went to shul on holidays and certainly on on the the high holidays um, and we observed we Friday night at our house was a command performance we had to dress up for what did dinner. That mean? How did you dress up? Well, it meant you didn't wear blue jeans. You you, you wore what you would wear to synagogue. You would wear nice pants and a button-down shirt and I don't know if we wore ties but uh, but certainly we, we couldn't come to dinner wearing what we came home from school with um, we would have to we would have to change and obviously as we got older <clears throat> um, we uh, uh, we went out after we being the the sons would you know, go out after dinner for do whatever we would do, but that was a concession already. By the time I came along, all these fights had been fought, but for my brothers, these were not givens that, um, that they would go out Friday nights. And how, how did your parents feel about the fact that their children and you sort of were, were much more functionally literate by then? You were I'm sure able to do Kiddush and do other things and read Hebrew more fluently than, than they, et cetera. Was that a good thing from their perspective? Um, I think they were a little perplexed about it, but um, particularly when I started taking it seriously, um, they were a little bit uh, confused because there was some judgment in that. Um, like I, I, when I realized that the kashrut that I grew up with wasn't really kashrut in the sense that I had later come to understand. At I what mean, point are you talking about? Is this high school still? Uh, no, this was pro. Uh, that was already in college mm -hmm. when I. But uh, you know, I, I I grew up in a kosher home, which meant that we didn't have kosher. We didn't have non-kosher meat. Um, we would wait until the the dishes were cleared before my father had milk in his coffee after a meat meal. We didn't have two sets of dishes. We didn't have two sets of, of silverware. Um, and when we went out, we could eat whatever we wanted. So, you know, shrimp with lobster sauce on Sunday nights was a kind of a standard. So <clears throat> I, it, it took me a long time to understand that there was a, that 
people were kosher, not houses were kosher. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a different, different concept there. Yeah, definitely. Um, was there a particular political atmosphere in your home? Nothing, nothing. I mean, we were clearly a Democrat family. I mean, but there was there was no, as I remember, major political conversation. So you attended the public high schools in, in right. Pittsburgh. I went to Taylor Aldrich, uh, which was a large public high school, um, and it was clearly tracked. You know, I was in the college track, and uh, so taking AP classes, and uh, the only time that I really interacted with essentially non-Jews in, in my high school was um, when we took shop. We had to take a shop, so I took wood shop, and, um, and in gym, and uh, I also was uh, kind of um, uh, manager of the track team, which meant that I carried the equipment and collected the towels after practice. <laughs> huh. So I got to, I, you know, that, 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 that's where I kind of interacted with the, the Catholics from Greenfield and some of the black students in yeah. different parts of the city. But your own classes were largely Jewish, it sounds like. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there may have been one or two non-Jews in our class. In terms of your Jewish education, you mentioned that you, you had a pretty intensive Jewish education for a conservative synagogue. At what point did you start to feel like you were really interested in this stuff? Or did you, during that period at all? It's not a question of being interested in it, because I mean I, I think that if, that if I didn't relate to it on some positive level, I probably would have found a way to get out of it. And the fact that I didn't meant that there was some that I was enjoying it on on some level. But it wasn't until um, college really that I realized that I was good at it and that it was something that you could be good at and that this was a differentiator and it was kind of a possible career track. Um, so that, that was really the, uh, that was really the difference. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, Camp Ramah in Canada was where you spent several, some, four summers I think, right when it was founded. So yeah, when, when it opened, yeah, 1960. Yeah. What was your experience of Ramah like, um, and how did it influence you, would you say, as you were? Well, I mean, I, I think that, as you've probably seen from other interviews, Ramah was a major factor in the identity formation of a lot of the people who went to the, uh, it became members of the Chavara. Um, it, was, um, it was a way of kind of integrating kind of the Jewish, identity with, um, with American values and, and, um, and, and ethos in, in, a, in a seamless way that was uh, quite exciting and, and, um, and, and, and energizing. And Ramah in Canada was, first of all, it was a gorgeous camp and um, it was out on a gorgeous lake and a lot of our activities were, were outdoors. Um, I don't remember baseball and softball, although I'm sure, sure we did, but I remember a lot about canoeing and sailing and we would go on four-day canoe trips up the, you know, I forget what the name of the lake was, but the, our lake, which I thought was huge, opened up into a, a real lake that was even huge. We'd go on long, really long expeditions and um, and that kind of physicality, but also integrated with obviously a Jewish uh, sensibility on on 
many levels, whether it was saying prayers that before you ate and, and after you ate, or, or uh, you know, the classes that we took, the studies that we did. Um, what kind of classes were there at Ramah in those early years that you remember at any rate? Mm, I mean, as I remember, they were, they were kind of basic. You, you had classes in prophets, and you had classes in modern Hebrew, and um, kind of really substantive types of classes. But also, the, the, at that time, Ramah was still, at least nominally, a Hebrew-speaking camp. So <coughs> even though we were encouraged to speak Hebrew, um, our counselors spoke to us in Hebrew pre predominantly, and certainly all the announcements of the camp were made in Hebrew. Um, the, uh, the plays were all done in, in Hebrew. I remember I was in Pirates of Penzance in, in Hebrew, in Oklahoma in Hebrew. And, uh, How is your background in, in comparison to other kids? were coming. Could you come to Ramah if you didn't have a strong Hebrew background or it would have been over your head completely? I was probably in somewhere in the middle. I mean there were there were there were kids there who had less Hebrew background than I did, but there were clearly kids who had a lot more, either you know, went to day schools or yeah. took their Hebrew classes more seriously than I did when I was in Beth Sholem. Can you elaborate at all on what you meant when you mentioned just now that it was a sort of melding of Jewish values and, and an American ethos? Well, again, because, um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the outdoor um, dimension of this, that it was, it was really a, a, a camp that uh, emphasized uh, um, the physical dimensions of um, of the the camp experience, and 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 yet it was integrated into. A, I mean, cause, so we would learn the the, although I've forgotten it, the name for the hatchets and axes and you know sleeping bags and um, in Hebrew and and um, and it felt like a very integrated. Uh, Type of um, type of experience where the the Jewish wasn't extraneous or external or added on, but was very much part of the fabric of living a normal life as a American teenager. I mean, the, you know, we. How did it affect your sense of uh, sort of Jewish? identity and, and, and Jewish spirituality. It sounds like um, brachot you mentioned were part of the everyday experience of living, whether it was blessings before and after meals and... Well, we davened every morning and, um, you know, put on tefillin after I was bar mitzvah and I... Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's partly where I, I became adept at leading tefillot because Campers would lead Fila, and even though I went to junior congregation, learned the skills when I was in in Hebrew school, um, this was kind of putting them into action in in, a, in an everyday uh, environment. Um, what was the question? <laughs> That's what we were talking about. Was it? Did it change your? Um, have an impact on your sense of sort of Jewish spirituality or how? Well, I became much more skilled at kind of just the practice, Jewish practice. Um, so that it, what I, what I was learning in Hebrew school was more or less almost theoretical because it wasn't put into action very often or when it was, it was in kind of, again, junior congregation, which was kind of like praying, but it, here this was actually a, um, you know, the real thing. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's go on to um, 
sort of your post high school experience, and you, you went to Brandeis um, for college. Um, how did you decide where to go? Well, I didn't want to go to Brandeis, as it turned out. Um, I didn't even apply to Brandeis. <laughs> Um, I applied to um, uh, Harvard, Tufts, Georgetown, and there was a there was a fourth school. I didn't get into Harvard. I got into Tufts, and I got into Georgetown, and I wanted to go to Georgetown. Um, I they. They, they had us down um, a, for like a recruiting weekend and went down there with my family, fell in love with the place. Um, I, would, I would have been one of ten Jews in my class and I found that actually somewhat exhilarating. I mean, I, already in this recruiting thing, there were, I was being asked all these questions about Judaism and um, I found that kind of interesting. Um, I, I was at that time still in the um, wake or in the shadow of my oldest brother, who was nine years older than me and had gone on to law school and was interested in international relations. And so I thought that I was going to go into law and go into the Foreign Service. and. Uh, Georgetown had a fabulous foreign service school. I would have been one year behind Bill Clinton. And so, you know, anyway, I was all set to go to, 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 go to Georgetown. And my, uh, my parents, particularly my mother, freaked out that I was going to go to a school that was decidedly not Jewish. I mean, not, not that it was she didn't mind my going to a non-Jewish school, but that, that it would be, this was Catholic. <laughs> And, uh, and she was really not happy about that. So she enlisted my older brother, my oldest brother, to um, prevail upon me to apply to Brandeis. And uh, so I applied late and I, I, got, I got in and I still didn't want to go. And uh, she somehow got me to agree to let him make the decision. And I don't know what bribe she offered him, but <laughs> he, th he said, I, sh I should go to Brandeis. So I, so I went to Brandeis. But um, it was not my first choice. Given that beginning, how was Brandeis for you? How did you find it? Well, come on, this was 1965 to 1969. It was the heyday of the, the chaos on campus. I mean, it was, it was and Brandeis was in not really, not the epicenter, but it certainly was one of the hotbeds of, of radicalism at, at, at that time. So it was, it, it was, it was thrilling. It was <laughs> the, the, the inmates were running the, 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 uh, the institution. And um, so I had, I had a great experience. I mean, I, I it ended up, I had terrific teachers who, who were very influential on, on my uh, on my development um, intellectually and 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 ultimately career wise. What, what um, did you study at Brandeis? As an my 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 degree was in politics, um, but I took a lot of courses in uh, philosophy and in uh, psychology. Uh, so those were kind of minors, although we didn't really have uh, minors. Um, Who were some of the most influential teachers you've had? Um, well, it's funny. I, I, I had, I took a couple of philosophy classes. Um, I'm trying to think what his name was. Meehan, I think, George Meehan, um, who I haven't really, didn't really follow afterwards, but um, had a profound influence on, on, on my 
critical thinking. I remember the first day of class, he said, you know, you can read every book here and you can pass every test, but if you don't show me that you're thinking, you're not going to pass. And it scared the shit out of me. I mean, <laughs> I said, gee, I know how to read and I know how to write, but I don't know how to think. And, and, uh, and that, uh, that kind of opened up a, a little path. I, I think I ended up taking three courses with him, and that, that was a great experience. Can you describe a little bit more of the political and social environment of Brandeis during this period? This was mid-60s, the, the anti-war activities were really ramping up, people were concerned about the draft, civil rights movement was in full swing at that point. What was the impact on Brandeis, on the Brandeis campus? On oh, you? Brandeis was, um, I mean, it was one of the areas that uh, there was a student takeover of the administration building and uh, there was the the <clears throat> the Black Student Union took over one of the the other academic buildings, and uh, um, you know it wasn't clear exactly what the demands were, but um, but it was you know that that was that was uh, you know our contribution to the uh, the student revolution. Um, uh, there was certainly a lot of anti-war activity. I think that was largely what the what the administration building was taken over for. Um, I think to have Brandeis issue some statement uh, opposing opposing the war. Um, but it was also, you know, this was a time of um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, so there was an annual Bronstein Day, which was. Bronson was was this kind of revered teacher of uh, of um, art history that um, for some reason became this icon. And Bronson Day was really a back and now. You know, they roasted a side of calf. Um, you know, a, a basically they roasted a, a calf on a spit and an open fire out in the courtyard of the castle and people were dropping acid and I mean it was you know the, it was a it was a it was a thing it was a you know and so it, it the, the the war and 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 civil rights and was certainly a a you know a lot of um, activity on that but there was also a lot of a lot of um, Uh, kind of drug related music related counter kind of counterculture yeah to to what extent were you involved in Brandeis Hill you haven't mentioned Jewish anything so far <laughs> at Brandeis um, so Brandeis Hill and also did you take any any sort of Jewish related courses while you were at Brandeis or not uh, I, um, well, I took Hebrew because um, the the summer before I entered Brandeis, I went to Israel and was on a kibbutz for for uh, for a couple of months. And when I came back, I took the placement test for French, which was my language up until, and everything came out in Hebrew. So I took the placement for Hebrew and placed into fourth year Hebrew. So I was, so I. So I had some acquaintance with, um, but I don't think I took any other Judaic courses. Um, my my relationship with with Hillel was kind of on the side of Hillel. Um, Al Axelrod was the Hill director of Brandeis. He, he, he began. Had he had just started. He began the year that I began. In fact, I remember my father taking me to the, the Hillel, uh, to the chapel where the Hillel office was, and introducing, you know, having me meet Al Axelrod and Al saying, well, we're both freshmen, you know, so. Uh, um, but then I really didn't spend any time there until I got back from, Is uh, I, I went to Israel in the first semester of my junior year, 
Brandeis had a um, Brandeis had its own uh, semester in Israel, which is called the Hyatt Institute, and it was, um, it was the focus of it was uh, social sciences, basically sociology, politics, and um, so I went on the Hyatt Institute, and that um, that became a a real turning point for me because um, we were supposed to leave on um, June 4th of 1967 and there was that whole build up at the time towards what eventually became the Six Day War um, and so our, our trip was postponed. We didn't leave on the, uh, on the 4th but we ended up leaving on the 14th. So the, the war went from the 6th to the 12th, and two days later, we were on a flight <laughs> to Israel. So um, coming into Jerusalem two days after the end of the, was just an extraordinary moment in time, and, and, and and studying there for the six months and the access to areas that hadn't been opened in... What do you remember about coming into Israel at that time? I mean, what was it like? Can you describe it at all? It was euphoric. I mean, it was euphoric. It was... I remember kind of first day walking up to the... Um, Which gate was it? Um, the Jaffa Gate, and uh, just it was like people. Everybody was in shock. The Israelis were in shock. The Arabs were in shock. I mean, everybody was was in shock. But but in but euphoric. I mean, it was just people streaming through the cities, and um, I mean that's kind of one one image. image that I that I have but uh, but that whole that whole six months we would go to Hebron, we'd go to Shrem, we would go we, you know you could go anywhere because everything was open and nothing was dangerous <laughs> oddly enough even though there had just been a you know horrendous war there so, um, so that that experience um, was really shaped me in 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 many in many respects. So when I came back from um, from Hyatt, I wanted to become more involved with Israel activism on campus. So I went to. Um, Hillel and talked with Al about it, and I think we did something in regard to that. I don't really remember, but um, what was what he got me into at that time was to get involved in the alternative minion that he was he wanted to start. So this was the same year that the Chavara. So I came back in basically the beginning of '68, and the Chavara was starting in '68. So Al, in, oh, so in the fall, planning year. yeah. So Al was kind of invo still involved, and and the idea of having alternative an alternative service was kind of very attractive to him. And certainly, it was, it was, you know, I I I kind of liked the idea too. Um, Had you ever met anybody, a Jew like Al, a rabbi like Al, at that point? What he represented. Um, no, I, th I think that he was probably one of the first to kind of um, kind of push the boundaries of, of Judaism into a more contemporary direction, as I think about it. Because this was before I had met Zalman, it was before I met Art Green, you know. Um, and Al, 
really, in a sense, steered me or encouraged me to explore those, those directions. Um, in my senior year, thinking about it, I, I mean, this, this, this may, he may have been the influence here, but in my senior year, uh, so this is 68, 69, um, at Brandeis at the time, if 10 students petitioned to have a class, they could get a class entered into the curriculum. Was, this was, <laughs> I told you, the inmates were in charge. So uh, I remember working with, um, getting together with a, another student, Cliff Trollin, um, and, um, and petitioning to have Zalman, who was studying at Brandeis at the time for his PhD, I think with Cyrus Adler, um, to teach class. And uh, now I didn't know, I really didn't know who Zalman was, but I assumed that it was Al who had kind of encouraged us to, to, to do something like this. So uh, yeah, so we got Zalman to teach a class which was called uh, Psychology of Religion, um, but was really, as I've come to see, Zalmanology. You know, it was, <laughs> and he he taught it as a lab course. So, what did that mean? That it it meant that every week we would have some laboratory experience or experiment. Okay, so one week, you know, Brandeis has three chapels, all done by the same architect all in the same style, basically all identical. Um, but our experiment was to walk through each of the chapels blindfolded and see if we could feel a difference in, in, each, of the, in each of the chapels. Um, so that was... Uh, well, could you? Um, Well, minor, my, I mean, minor, because basically you're feeling cold brick in, in, in any of them. But I did have a, a, a kind of um, epiphany in the Jewish chapel, which um, it's a little, a little embarrassing to, to report, but uh, so, so the, the, um, the bima was kind of down at one end of the chapel, of, of the, the chapel, and as I remember it, and so I'm, you know, feeling my way, and you, you feel the wall and the pews, and you kind of walking down, come up to the bima, come up to the ark, and, you know, the curtain, feeling the curtain in front of the Torah, and then reaching my hand behind the curtain and feeling the covering of the, the Torah covering and reaching my hand under the under the Torah mantle and touching this kind of smooth skin. I mean it became very erotic. Um, and it was really the first time that I got this glimpse of the Torah as this feminine symbol um, in a really visceral fashion. Did you go off campus also as part of these TED experiences that you were having? Well, uh, the labs themselves were all on campus. So let me just give you a, a, a couple of the others. One, one was he took us into the theater, and um, we all lie down on the on the stage, and he he, he put on um, a recording of uh, Leonard Bernstein's Kaddish Symphony, and it was I, I think we were all stoned at the time, but it was just this really <laughs> remarkable 
kind of experience. Um, so that, that was the stuff that we did on campus, um, but then we, we also had an assignment for the, the course to visit 10 different religious ceremonies around Boston. None of, the, none of them could be the ones that we grew up in. So of your choice, though? Uh, yeah, whatever we wanted. So I, I went to Hare Krishna, I went to the Boston Rebbe, you know, the Hasidic uh, place. Um, I went to uh, um, um, a Catholic service, I mean, you know, a variety of different, and then you, we have to write about them. And one of them, as it turned out, was I went to uh, Shabbat services at, at, at the Chavara that had just, had just begun that year. And, um, and then I wrote about it. So I, I actually have the, rec I, I'll, I'll send it to you, soon. but I, I actually have my rather inflated rhetoric about <laughs> my experience of Shabbat at the Chavara. I danced through the streets with the Sabbath queen at my side. <laughs> it, was, it was a little inflated, but... Um, what do you remember about it? What were your impressions? Well, it was like uh, unlike anything that I had ever experienced before in, in my life, but it was it, it was revelatory in a sense. I mean, you know, we were sitting down on the floor. First of all, I mean, that was in this this room wasn't particularly aesthetic or attractive room. You know, it was just a room in an apartment um, or in a house, and. Um, and rel relatively small number of people, uh, maybe 20. Um, Zalman was leading the service and doing his, his thing. So there was singing and there was, there, it, and, and it, it followed the course of a service, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't what I was brought up with or experienced at Camp Ramah, which was kind of following the Matbea Tefillah in a very organized way. And it was just, it just was life of her. I don't, I don't know, it was, it, it's hard to, to, to really capture, but the, the kind of the, the difference in the, in the, the approach to, uh, I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was praying like they meant it, you know, like there was, there were, this was a serious religious experience. Do music, did the music at Chavrat Shalom in that first Shabbat sort of move you particularly? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, this, this wasn't just, you know, sing a song, you know, sing it through and then move on. This was sing it until it was, until it kind of had grabbed you and take, taken you on a journey and brought you home, and, and that was, uh, uh, that was characteristic of, of music at the, uh, at the Chavara in general, but this was, you know, seeing this for the first time, experiencing it for the first time was, yeah. So even though it was a Jewish service and it was, you know, it was a Shabbat service and I had been to Jewish service, the, this was not a service that I had grown up with, <laughs> so it fit the category of, you know, a different religious tradition, as it were. Um, so, what was the impact on you personally of, of going to this service? Did it uh, sort of have any immediate influence on how you thought about Well, it, 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 um, It opened up for me uh, that there was that there was a that there was something new happening, and that um, there was a uh, that there was a new that there were new opportunities opening up that I hadn't had any consciousness of before. I wasn't really focused at that time 
on um, on the Chavara as a possible uh, venue for me, but um, but that just seeing that opened up the, the sense that there is something there there's there's something here that I didn't I hadn't realized before, and that this was an an avenue that. that bore looking into. No. Did you know Art Green before that service? No, that was the first time that I met him, as I remember, yeah. And did you continue your relationship with him, or mm -mm. not at that point? Mm -hmm. you be, so you became a member of Chabarat Shalom actually the following year. Right. So, so that senior year was, was very important, um, partly, again, the, the aftermath of the Israel experience, partly um, not being entirely um, uh, convinced that I really wanted to go into law at that time. Um, I, I had taken another course at at Brandeis um, in psychology of religion, I mean, it was, but taught from a totally different perspective by this guy James Clee, um, and began to 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 understand that I was much more attracted to spirituality and to um, spiritual search, particularly attracted to Eastern um, dimensions of of spirituality, uh, particularly Hinduism at, at the time. Um, and uh, Klee was, I wouldn't say he was anti-Semitic, but he liked to tweak the Jewish students. Um, so I, I remember, for instance, he, he, drew, he drew this diagram on the board and the challenge, the challenge was, can you take can you draw a single line through all segments of this diagram without crossing any segment twice? And in two dimensions, you can't do it, right? So people were struggling to sort of And he said, well, in order to do it, you have to draw a, um, you, you have to go into a third dimension and go over the line and come, come back. And he says, you Jewish students probably think that's anti-Semitic. Now, I, re I remember this, this comment very clearly and thinking, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean? That, and as I thought about it, he, 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 he was indicating that kind of Judaism, at least the way that we're, we were being taught it or is, within the lines, you know, and there, you don't break out of the lines. As and in a system of laws? I, I guess, I guess he was referring to that, but that it's a, it's a kind of a constrained system. It's, it's, it's within the knowns, and it doesn't look at the unknowns. And I, you know, as I was reading more about um, the, the Eastern religions and, um, you know, some of their senses of the feminine Godhead and, and, and you know, kind of these, these impressions from whatever of my background started coming out. I said, well, you know, there, there, there seems to be some of this in Judaism too. I mean, you know, it, it, isn't there something? So I, I said, you know, before I I go down this path. I, I think I should look at at the Jewish uh, the Jewish stuff more seriously and see if uh, if uh, if Klee's wrong. That it's. <laughs> Did you do you remember having conversations with Zalman in, in which you were exploring these new kinds of ideas and, and perspectives within Judaism? Did he continue? To be an influence? Well, this course proved to be extremely important to me. I mean, the, the, uh, 
um, just the experiences that, that we were having and the and the 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 terminology and the perspectives that Zalman would bring to normal experience, but kind of with his characteristic twist and, and absolute mastery of metaphor, um, kind of just explode the, the, the concepts into, other, it was, was extremely attractive to me. So, um, um, so that did have, have a big um, impression on me. I, 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 one, one of the exercises for the class I, I mentioned is um, um, there's a, a, a famous Bratislav story, the, the, seven, the seven Beggars, you know, and one of, one of Zalman's exercises for people was to to write the seventh beg the the, it, the seven the seven beggars is 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 a very complicated series of stories of stories within stories and um, but there's only six stories told and the seventh story is kind of left till the Messiah comes and so one of Zalman's exercises was write the seven seventh beggars story you know and and. I, I got seriously engaged in, in, in trying to figure the, this one out. And, uh, and it became a kind of a mystical journey in and of itself. I mean, I, I remember I, I was stuck at a certain point in, in, the, in the, the kind of this, the, this intricate structure of the, of the story, and I had a dream. And the story came to me in a dream. Literally, I mean, I I never dream like this. But I woke up and I that that kind of captured the story. And um, can you convey some of your what, what was going on in the story for you and in this dream? Well, I should have reread it before <laughs> before this interview, <laughs> but. But I didn't. Uh, so all, all I know is that the the all I remember is that the, the story basically was about the um, the collapse of opposites into into a into a harmony um, where distinctions kind of disappear into the the wholeness of the experience. I mean that's essentially wh where where the story was going. Um, Um, but within each story, so there's, there's the beggar who has an infirmity who comes to the wedding couple to say, you think that I am lame, but actually the roads of this world mean nothing to me. So, and, and then proceeds to tell a story that reveals the blessing in the infirmity. So, so that, that was kind of the structure that I was trying to, what, what was the story that the beggar, who I can't even remember what his infirmity was, was dealing with that would lead to kind of this. Anyway, so. Uh, and this story was later published. It was like yeah, yeah. Zalman published the Seven Beggars stories and and his translation. His translation, English. yeah. And and he 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 added this. And then then there was a record. He he did a, he did a record of it, and recorded it, because uh, he thought that in some way Rab Nachman's spirit had manifest in some way through through this. But um, sounds like you were rather taken with or infused with mysticism at that point? I was. I was, I was very, uh, yeah, I was very drawn to it and... Uh, um, what, what was it about Hinduism that was particularly drawing you? 
I think it was a multiple uh, faces of God that it offered, that it wasn't just, you know, kind of the old man in the sky, but it was, you know, the dancing God and the challenging God and the feminine God. And the, I mean, that, 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 that reality has so many dimensions and the d divinity can be seen in, in, in all of these, these dimensions without um, precluding, you know, any, any aspect of experience from it. So that, that I think was, was what I was particularly uh, attracted to. But also, I mean, at, at this time, yoga was just beginning to emerge, I mean, just beginning to, to emerge. And I started getting very involved in some, um, some yoga. Um, yeah, did, the, did that become a, a real practice for you? Uh, it did, it did, yeah. Um, beginning in late college, but then carrying over into, into the Kavara. I, I became a, I wouldn't say a disciple, but I, I certainly was a hanger-on with Swami Satchanananda, who was this kind of wonderful, puckish guru. And, um, and, the, and at, at the Chavara, we became very close with we meaning the community in some ways, but also some of us in particular became very close with, um, uh, we just knew her as Madaji, uh, who had a, um, uh, an ashram in Cohasset that we would go spend time with. And, it sounds and, like the whole spiritual universe was sort of opening up to you at the same time that you were also beginning to explore these similar ideas and looking for them within Judaism. Well, I was, they were opening up for me and I wanted to find them in Judaism. Mm -hmm. So what led you from this point in your senior year in college to actually decide to explore the Chavara seriously? Well, um, So, so there was this confusion about where I was going and the fact that law school was less and less of an interest uh, to me. There was this rising spiritual quest um, and my interest in pursuing it within a, a Jewish framework. Um, and so I started looking at what were my alternatives at that point? I wasn't going to go to the seminary. I mean, JTS. Um, but were you, were you thinking about the rabbinate? Well, I, I began. Point? I mean, see, this was the point at which I, I, I began saying, you know, I'm I'm pretty good at this Jewish thing, you know. So you know, I, I, what's what's the way of professionalizing this in some capacity, or making a living out of it, or you know. And um, so the rabbinate was pretty much where you went. I mean, but, but what other, that was, in the, that was in the natural progression. So um, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College had recently opened up, I think maybe the same year. Yeah, and, and that was very attractive because it also offered a PhD. So, you know, you can go to get you know, a hedge your bets and get a secular, you know, degree at the same time. And, um, and then there was Chavara, and the Chavara was much riskier because even though it was Chavara Shalom Community Seminary, and the seminary was a, defini a, a, a defining part of it, it was, it, it was a rabbinical program. Um, it was, it, it, 
it was just starting. It didn't have any, any institutional backing to it. It was who knew what it was. It was, you know, and so it was a real, it was a real risk. So there was this reconstructionist thing on this side and there was cover on, on this side and um, so I remember, I mean, there was, I, I also in a somewhat embarrassing mode, but um, I, I, uh, I had taken mescaline at one point in the senior year and had this fabulous experience and just kind of the harmony of the universe just revealed itself to me in a, in a and um, when I came down from that trip, I, I ripped up my ticket to the law boards. And so I knew I, that was up. <laughs> and I was, I, 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 I said, I, I, I want to I wanna apply to the, the cover up. I mean, that, I, I felt that was where, um, That was where my inner drive was leading me, not, not towards, I mean, even though the Reconstructions offered this kind of safety, safe harbor of a, of a PhD, that that's really wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in the more personal religious search, and that's what the, the Chavra seemed to offer. Would, would, would you say that was what the main appeal of the Chavara was for you at that point? Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Can, can you describe the process you went through in being admitted as a member? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, so that I was, I came in the second year. So the. So this was sixty nine. This, this is was also the year that uh, the draft. Uh, oh, the draft! I forgot to talk about the draft. Yeah, the draft. <laughs> <laughs> this this was another. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm I, I'm I'm sorry. I should have mentioned this. That the um, the draft did play a, a major major role in my decision. That. Um, at that point, all deferments were canceled. Right. So, um, like my middle brother was deferred because he got married. So they still had a married deferment. Graduate school deferments were gone. Other um, than a very few situations, like seminaries. Yes. So there was there was four D, which was divinity, um, and that was basically what was. I mean, there was conscientious objection. But I wasn't, I didn't think that I was going to be able to pass a conscientious objection. And then there was, you know, physical and psychological and, you know, that's, that, that would be a crapshoot. And um, so, uh, and then there was the lottery and my number was like 56, I think. And uh, they were drafting up to 120. So. This became a very real concern, and uh, and uh, rabbinical school offered a four D deferment. In fact, I, I it wasn't the only reason that the chavara was established, but it was not without some consequence in the in the creation of the chavara. Right. Um, and they had actually gone to some lids to make sure that they had the 4D. The 4D, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were chartered by the state and, and exactly. you know. So, uh, so yeah, so, so this was, I graduated in 69, so um, I started applying, I guess, in, in early 1969. I was this, the, the first group um, of Members, members were were both students and and faculty because it was a community, and I mean this eventually became 
the tension that broke up the Chavaraz as it was at that point, but at that point it was still trying to be both a community and, and, uh, and, and a seminary. And the process was that um, I had to meet with five of the, um, there was probably an essay that I had to write or something like that, but I had to meet with five, five of the members and have these personal interviews with them. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was in its own way a very grueling experience because these were each quite interesting individuals who had their own ways of interviewing. Uh, one, for instance, Steve Zweibaum was just an hour or so spent in silence just looking at each other. That was, During your interview? That was the interview. He, he was not a person of very many words, so it was <laughs> just kind of sitting looking at each other for an hour. Felt like an hour, could have been more. <laughs> um, I met with um, Joey Reamer. That was a kind of a normal type of interview. Um, met with, uh, with Art and uh, that was, a, that was a difficult encounter, actually. Um, well, art, if you know him, is a rather intense personality and um, I was still very tentative about all of this stuff, so you know I'm not sure that my dynamic uh, meshed all that well with his, uh, uh, but we got over it. But that that was the nature of the of the uh, the interviewing process. I met with a couple of other people. I think Jim Kugel. Was, it was a member at the time, and oh, and Michael Brooks, who I knew from Brandeis because he was a year ahead of me, and we had some interaction. But that was also a very kind of intense and not a lot of talking interview. Kind of. So a lot, a lot was based on kind of. Um, uh, a sense of interpersonal rapport and tolerance for silence and <laughs> yes yeah yeah okay. were you anxious about whether you'd be admitted I don't recall very much. I'm, I'm sure I, I had probably some anxiety about it, but um, again, I had a fallback. So, and, and I wasn't really committed into this path yet. No. And there was a sense that You know, there was a sense that I was going to be admitted. I mean, there, there was there, there wasn't a, a lot of question about it. I mean, I had I had good bona fides. But Zalman was referring me, and Al Axelrod was referring me. You know, so I, I had good recommendations. Yeah. So when did you find out that you had in fact been admitted? Was it was it a quick process? I I guess so. I I don't I don't really recall much about that spring, but must have been because that summer I went to Camp Ramah with half of my, the class who came 
something. <laughs> With half of whom? Half of the, the entering class of, of, uh, of the Chavara, you know, as teachers and, and counselors. And Camp Rama in Palmer? In Palmer, yeah. Was that your first time there? As a, yeah. Mm -hmm. As faculty? Or as, yeah. As, Were you there as faculty or as, or as a Well, I started a as, as a counselor and then I became faculty. Mm -hmm. That year, the, the year after, I think, I became and became faculty. But the, you know, they eventually closed Palmer because, partly because of us. <laughs> we, we were having, we were having too good a time as a cohort. We didn't really pay enough attention to the campers. The campers were, had, had, had a great time, but it got a little undisciplined. <laughs> When was it that they closed it? I believe the chronology is, okay, 69, 70, I think they closed it in 71. And I went back in 72, I was, a, I was faculty in 72. So they closed it for one summer, you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, that summer in 69 it was, uh, Joey Reamer and Alan Mintz um, and I forget who else was, was, were unit heads. And then it was George Saverin and Bella and me and Gail Reamer, Reamer Tversky. Tversky at the time. Um, and uh, who well, else? There, there were there were others who were either in the chavara or in that mm -hmm. realm who were also on staff at the time. And so you your formal membership started in when was it? September? Well, I guess I when guess we got back from yeah, I guess when we got back. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the chavara's notion of community at the point you became involved? It's actually very difficult for me to to um, to describe this. Um, I've tried over the years in in talking about Chavaran. It's always somehow never quite captured what um, the <clears throat> as I understood it, the Chavara was. Um, wanted to be an intentional community, essentially a, um, a monastery in the city. Um, Why do you choose the word monastery? Because it was to be a religious community, um, men, um, because that's who all the members were at that time. Um, <coughs> women weren't, hadn't been ordained um, in reform or reconstructionist. Um, But the, the, I say monastery because a monastery is a very um, enclosed uh, world, encapsulated world. And I think that that's what I understood the intention of the Chavara to be, that, that when you joined the Chavara, you were committing yourself to the community as your primary uh, focus um, so that as I remember it, in order to um, do anything outside the community, you had to get the permission of the community, which meant to go to graduate school, as I did in my second year there, um, to teach at, uh, I taught um, 
Hebrew High School at uh, Mishkan Tvila, um, you had to get the permission of the of the community essentially to to do this um, because your primary um, universe was really to be the community, which is study there, to engage with your spiritual life in that arena. So, um, so it, that's, that's why it had the sense of, of being a monastery, which is a committed religious community, although in the city, meaning that it had porous borders and the doors were open. Um, and yet there were, in the beginning anyway, full-time and part-time members, as I understand it. Um, you, I gather, were a full-time member. I was a full-time member, yeah. And I don't know anybody who came in with me who was a part-time member. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Um, and those who came in with you, were they um, interested in the Chavara as a seminary, as a community seminary, or not entirely? Not the entire group? Huh. Um... Well, I would say that most of them were. Um, I mean, we were doing a, we, we did have a, a kind of a, a course of study, as it were. Um, a, a relatively set curriculum? Oh, it wasn't set, but the dimensions of it were set. Rabbinics and classical text and chassidut mm -hmm. and um, and then kind of various practical dimensions, whether it's tefillah or... Um, <clears throat> I mean, thinking back on it now, I, I realize that a lot of the people who came in with me were not on a rabbinical track. Um, George Saverin may have started, but he quickly became involved in doctoral work and and David Roskies was also I think more interested in the kind of the intellectual academic dimension. And people were doing various kinds of things. Joe Reamer was at the Ed School at Harvard, I believe. Um, so okay. they weren't all engaged in rabbinical training as a primary uh, yeah. Endeavor at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember anything of the dynamic between full time and part time people during the time that you were there? Well, <clears throat> in the beginning, no. I mean, there, there, it it seemed to be fairly seamless, and and I think that, that most of the part time people were considered more on the teacher side of things. Buzzy Fishbane, so he was at Brandeis and um, Hill Levine was at Harvard and you know. Um, <coughs> it became uh, an issue um, in uh, in my third year there, the, the, so the fourth year of the cover up became a real issue because a group of people came in who were very... So this is 71, 72 that year? 71, 72, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who were very communitarian and they, they wanted, they, they, they really pushed that value and, um, and in pushing it, broke it. In other words, you know. What does that mean concretely? What were they pushing? That, and w well, they were they were saying were they as for? as a community, we there are no teachers and there are no students, right? Mm -hmm. We're all teachers. We're all students. Um, I I 
I paid $500 a year to belong to the Chavara. The teachers were not paid, they, they were, I believe, getting some kind of a stipend. So there, this was already a differentiator in terms of the dynamic of the community. And, and there were this group of people who said, you know, if we're really a community, then, you know, this is bullshit. Let's, you know, and, and there, were, there were those who felt very strongly about that, and there were those who felt very strongly that if that's what it is, we're not interested in it. And um, On which side? People who were faculty or, or faculty? Yeah, mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. But also students. I mean, I, I wasn't particularly interest, interested in that, pushing the, the community dimension of this that hard. I was... Mm -hmm. I was fine. I mean, because it, essentially, on, and outside of of uh, the um, outside of curricular issues, it, it wasn't an issue. In other words, when it comes to came to any of the other dimensions of, of the community, in terms of setting up community standards and 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 how we conducted services and, and, and celebrations and meals and all other and, and divided up work tasks and, and, and things like that. It was a community, but it was only in this one dimension, as I, as I recall, that it was really this, <coughs> this uh, tension. When would that tension come to the surface and how? Was it during communal meetings, the community meetings that yeah. happened on a regular mm -hmm. basis? And and there was a group of, of 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 members who lived in another building, another and and they were kind of that was kind of it was called Dorton, you know, there, <laughs> and they were the, the kind of the the spearheads of it, and and it <coughs> created tension within. The, uh, the rest of, of the community, and ultimately, some people left. They left. Other people, you know, left. And um, is this the same period that a group uh, left for, and became part of the founders of Kibbutz Gezer? Also, that was a little earlier, actually. That the the Gezer the Gezer group was <clears throat> sixty nine seventy. I, I think it was in that much, a, a little bit earlier earlier period. Yeah. And I don't think it, it had it. That was because of this issue. I think they just, you know, wanted to mm -hmm. make Ali hours, spend time in Israel. I mean, when I when I left, I left in seventy two. <clears throat> I was the last rabbinical student. Um, Meaning the last person who had come in for the purposes of studying for the rabbinate. And the last person who was there. Still expecting to become to, a rabbi. To become a rabbi. I see. Okay. Um, and in fact, I left to go to JTS to continue my rabbinical work. But at, at that point, so the 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 in 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 reality, this tension between the community and the seminary, Chavarat Shalom Community Seminary, the community and the seminary were in conflict, and ultimately what happened is it became neither a community nor a seminary. You know, it, it, it didn't become a community in the sense that the, the people who really wanted it to be a totally egalitarian uh, community wanted, and it certainly didn't become a seminary. You know, the, the, the <coughs> illusion at that point that it was a seminary kind of dissipated. At that point, what year are we talking about now? Well, that was seventy-two. I left in seventy-two. Seventy-two, but until until that point, had it felt? I mean, what was happening that was changing the understanding of whether or not Chavarat Shalom actually was functioning as a seminary? Well, I think a lot of people came in who, frankly, weren't interested in in studying for the for for. The, Rabbinical uh, word nation. But um, they were being admitted after, you know, a pretty right, rigorous so, process, so, so that must have been clear. Right. So the. Right. So the 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 boundaries were 
began to be a little bit elastic at, at this point. Um, there were a lot of tensions that were pulling away from the community. First of all, people were getting married, not beginning to have families yet, but but the marriages became the focus of their of their lives as opposed to the community. Many people who were involved in these early years, however, described their relationships as being essentially nurtured in the context, within the context of Chavarot Shalom. People who got married during this period or had serious girlfriends, typically, they were men. Um, so that seems a little bit at odds with what you're saying. Well, um, couples, couples sort of were subsumed within the community, it felt like, in, these, in the very early years. They were, they were, but in terms of the energy that the individual was putting into the community, um, that became, a, a lot of it became devoted now to the relationship as opposed to the community. Mm -hmm. So it was a relaxing of that community either. Yeah, and embraced more people, but the, the links were... Mm -hmm. uh, at what point did you get married? Long after I left the Havara. Long after, yeah. okay. So not during this period at all. No, no. Okay. Um, many people have commented about um, the constant need to engage in group processing. Mm. Um, as as part of um, the effort to create this intentional uh, community, do you have memories of this? Um, and can you describe what that was like? What were some of the issues that were being that were surfacing also? Well, it. It, it was excruciating. <laughs> um, Everybody says that. That it was tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was, uh, these were, uh, we, we had a couple very intense tea groups or uh, group process sessions, but long. I mean, what's a tea group? Can you explain? I forget what. What it stood for, but a tea group was essentially a, a a group of people getting together and going at it in terms of group dynamics and and inner inner group dynamics and um, kind of trying to resolve issues both public and private, but in a in a common kind of public space. Way. Yeah, I mean there were certain rules to it. But um, it really depended on having skilled facilitators, and uh, I'm not sure that we always did have skilled facilitators. Were there facilitators? Were there people playing sort of leadership roles in yeah. that context? Mm -hmm. um, I, at least in one of the instances, we did have an outside facilitator. Um, but... Uh, But there were there were times when personal um, conflicts surfaced and uh, became rather brutal, and um, and and ultimately, <clears throat> in some ways, very destructive of what we were trying to create. Ironically, mm -hmm. um, one of the rules is you don't walk out, right? You engage and you you engage and you engage and you resolve at a certain point. Well, in one instance, the wife of a member walked out, and that caused a bit of a crisis because 
then the member had to leave and <clears throat> it was um, destructive, it was harmful. There were also other, I mean, I, I introduced uh, co-counseling into the Chavarai. When I was in doing graduate work, I, I took a course with Maury Stein at, at Brandeis, who was, had become enamored of co-counseling at, at the time and kind of was teaching a class in co-counseling. So I, I started getting into it and <coughs> became... What, what is co-counseling? Can you just describe co it? Co-counseling is, is, a, um, is a form of a peer, peer-to-peer um, counseling, essentially, where it... Again, there, there's a certain framework and rules, but uh, essentially the, the, the premise is that we're all carrying around residual hurt that um, can be released through various physical manifestations, shaking, crying, laughing, a variety of things, and that you can facilitate the discharge of these emotions by active listening. Um, and, and as a peer-to-peer, -to -peer -to -peer, uh, it would be, uh, so we would have a session, and for an hour I would be listening to you and any questions that I would ask would be asked not for my information but to help you further engage with whatever emotions you were addressing at, at that point. And then after an hour we would switch roles and um, so this became a, a, a kind of a therapeutic process that I introduced into the Chevron and a lot of I'm not sure if everybody did it, but a lot of a lot of people did it. So I mean, that was that was helpful. Um, I, I wouldn't say that these T group or these these encounter sessions were all <clears throat> all negative, but I think the overwhelming um, lasting impact is the the hurt that came out of it, as opposed to the the benefit. Although there was one phrase that that we learn to adopt, which is, I would like to sleep with you, but I choose not to. That, that, became, that became the kind of a, a mantra that we would... What does that mean? Well, because it, it was kind of addressing the sexual tension in... in so specifically? Yeah. yeah. Quite literally, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how metaphoric that was. No, 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 this was very explicit, you know. I would like to sleep with you, but I choose not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in a way you've been touching on this, but I just want to ask it more explicitly. Um, so a, a related aspect of this group processing was what some people call the new age of interpersonal sharing and the the ability to share and be open to every other member, um, as well as the ideal of balancing individualistic and communal needs and, and ideals. And um, does that resonate for you, that, that, that particular tension, the need for people to, f people were engaged in their own personal spiritual there was a, there was an expectation that you would have deep personal meaningful relationships with everybody in the in the group, but it was clear that 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 was an ideal that was not going to be achieved. I mean, some people felt that more keenly than others um, on either side of 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 it. In other words, wanting to have closer relationships with some and being rebuffed or not being invited in. And, um, but I, th that wasn't a major issue for me. A, lo a, lot of, a lot of this, and I'm, I'm sure this is not a surprise to you, but a, a lot of this revolved around art. I mean, a lot of these issues revolved around people's relationship with art. 
How, how so? How did one person become so central in this? He was the <laughs> he was the central figure. I mean, he, everything really revolved around art and his personality and his. Um, His likes and dislikes, and a lot of a lot of emotion was spent on trying to negotiate that relation, the the distance between themselves and. and I mean, art. for each individual person, mm -hmm. wanting to be close or yeah. whatever mm -hmm. uh, with him personally, and yet. For most people, it sounds like during this early period, Chavarat Shalom was the center of their lives and of their community. Mm -hmm. The people with whom they did things, um, worshipped, ate. Yeah, it certainly was for me. Uh huh. So in a, in a way, many things did work towards the creation of community. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the most important elements in that sort of positive push towards community? Well, um, certainly in Kavarat Shalom, prayer was a major element of binding the community. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to that in one sec because I want to spend some real time on that. What, what about, um, for instance, communal meals? Me, I was just going to say meals as well. And meals had an almost prayer-like um, dimension to them, uh, because it was always singing at meals. And what what meals are you talking about, for instance? Well, there was always uh, once a week there was a communal meal. So even at that communal meal, you mean the Wednesday night meeting one that was often followed by a meeting or a program? Yeah. And there was singing as part of that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. not just, for instance, uh, or retreats or something like or that. Or retreats. Or retreats, yeah. yeah. And retreats was another place where the community really um, bonded very strongly. Mm -hmm. We had retreats several times a year. What about Shabbat, Arab Shabbat meals? And the, the, Shabbat, the community as a, quote, inviting community? Yeah, well... <clears throat> um, yeah, Friday night, but it, it wasn't as the entire community. But yeah, the 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 um, one of the conditions of membership supposedly was that you could walk to the chavara, right? So that walking to people's houses became, mm -hmm. um, you know, an important element. And yeah, so Friday nights were and and Shabbat lunch. I mean, those were two critical. Bonding experiences. Yeah. Were there um, a sense of cliques within the within the community, or or not? Um, I mean, did for instance, did a certain couple tend to invite the same people over and over again to Arab Shabbat, or would they really consciously try to invite different people over the course of time? Again, um, Art and Kathy were kind of the Ur house. I mean, that's <laughs> so. And I, I think they were they were pretty good at making sure that their house was embracing of of, of the community. Now I don't know how whether people felt that maybe they weren't invited enough, or they were. I mean, I yeah, I, that. that I, I don't I don't know, but yeah. everybody else was kind of more peripheral in, right. in that regard. So let, let's let's turn to tefillah, which was obviously a central piece of life in the community. H how would you describe the attitudes towards tefillah within Chavarat Shalom, and and how did that relate to your experience of prayer in other settings? Well, certainly in the in the initial. A uh, couple of years, 
um, prayer um, was a very open quotient. I mean, the the um, no one service was like any other service. I mean, there was no, there was, there was really no no set liturgy or musical frames. Every, every service was its own invention. And <clears throat> the responsibility, whoever was leading the service was a tremendous amount of responsibility to be a a good guide um, to open an, an area of exploration that people would go with, but you know you really have to prove that. It was worth staying with you. <laughs> there, the, the, there, were, uh, there were some real masters. Bert Jacobson, for instance, was really a master of, of, of melody. And he would often pick a melody that would go through the entire service. Um, not every uh, psalm or tefillah, but Wo weaving it in at points so that it would it would build and climax and um, nuance and move in, and and it was it was a, just a masterful construction. Um, so so very often there was a <clears throat> there would be a whoever was the, leading the service would give a. Uh, an opening kavanah, which would then dictate the the course of the rest of the the service, which which psalms would be would be done in the Sukkot de Zimra, and which melodies would be would be sung. And um, what, can you think of an example or two of kavanot that people might bring? I remember one, for instance, I don't remember who it was, maybe it might have been Joel Rosenberg. Somebody was talking about, talking about light. It was for Hanukkah, and they, the, the Kavanah was about light. It was woven through, but... Could be. I mean, I, just, I, can't, I can't come up with any, okay. any ones in, in specific. Um, it's more a feeling tone that sort of yeah, is I mean, arising you, you, for you. And, and, you know, if services started at 10, people were there at 10. This was not like... You know, you show up around uh, Torah reading. It, it's the, the you were in for the ride, and and it was the ride that you wanted, and um, and it was exhilarating. I mean, it was just to to kind of, uh, kind um, of go on that journey each week. Many people have talked about or mentioned the the intensity of the singing or of davening as an experience. That sounds like that resonates for you. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. No, it was. <laughs> what What was it about the the singing and the davening that made it so powerful? Well, <clears throat> as, as I as I put it somewhere, people people were davening like they meant it. I mean, there, there was the 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 sense of kavana of of really getting into the words in a Deep, deep, deep <laughs> way was was palpable, and um, <clears throat> so it, I became at, at at a certain point at one of the the leaders of the dominant, right? But it was um, took a while for me to develop. The, I mean, I had the skills. I knew how to how to lead davening, you, you know, from junior congregation to camp or ma. But this type of davening was 
something. I mean, you 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 had you had to. You really had to be. You had to be skilled, and you had to be flexible, and you had to be confident, and um, it, was, it, it, it was a complicated. So the first time that I <laughs> I led davening. How far into your tenure there was it? I was would it say it was the spring of my first year. Okay. Must have been because I, I certainly wouldn't have done it in the in the fall, but I think it was the spring of my first year, and we were on a retreat, and I I was I was absolutely terrified about <laughs> about doing this. And I, I decided that what I would do is open up, start with an exercise. Um, I was part of a theater group at this time that was doing ecological theater. You know, <laughs> but um, somebody who had, who had come to the Chavara was kind of a regular visitor, uh, was organizing a, a kind of this this pick up theater group and invited members of the Chavara if they wanted to put so, so I and a couple of other people were part of this theater group. And we used to do this exercise to, to start the, our theater process and, um, and I found it a very opening experience. So I, I decided that I would begin the davening with this exercise and then after that kind of see where things went. So the exercise was lie down on the floor and kind of took people through a, a kind of um, relaxation, centering experience. And then imagine a sound internally and then begin to vocalize it externally and then do it louder and louder and then allow the sound to bring you up to your feet and then move with the sound into the center of, of sound in the room and then um, and then kind of draw back and all the while sounding your sound. You know. So that was the exercise and, and at the end of that we were good. Okay, so <coughs> we started this. People started vocalizing and it was gorgeous. It was just this, this cacophony of sound but it was absolutely gorgeous. And people got up and went into the center and then they kind of moved back. And I was about to call it to a close and somebody started saying, uh, Shmah. And then somebody else picked up and then somebody else picked up Shema. and then other people started coming in and then somebody else said Safa Safa and other words started coming in and then bits of prayers started coming in and it took on a life of its own and a nigun emerged out of it and went on for I don't know how long and then back into these sounds bouncing off 
It went on, must have gone on for an hour. And then it closed. And we all looked at each other and we said, well, that was Shacharis. And that was it. That was, that was the... Is that what you meant when you wrote in your questionnaire about um, singing at times having this leaderless and evolving quality? Well, that was certainly an example of it, but that was not the only example. What are some other examples? Well, singing, I, I, I've experienced there like I've never experienced anywhere else, where, I mean, normally you, you go into, you, you do a chant and you sing it three times and, you know, it's over. It, this, 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 the songs that the cover would, would go on would go on and on and on and on and on. And at a certain point, they would take on their own life. Nobody was leading it. But it was, it, it, it had a, it had an organic intensity to it that you were, you just became part of this sound and this, it, it, the sound combined with words, and the, the words then, you know, adding an intensity to it that, you know, go on 10, 15 minutes. I mean, no, no one was counting, and, and no one was going anywhere, and, you know, it's, and there was a, there was um, not an expectation that this would happen, but there was certainly an invitation to it and a, and a willingness to, to go in that direction. So that was your first time leading? Yeah, well, I, then, then, then I could do pretty much whatever I wanted after that because, you know, that, that, that kind of broke all the... All the, all the it's a spectacular first. <laughs> I know, and everybody thought I was brilliant. I had no, but it it, it it was emblematic, really, of something about the Chavra. People people invest. They, for some reason, trusted me with that with with that, and, and invested themselves in that process, and 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 kind of allowed that dynamic to just carry them. Wherever it, and there are still phrases, Safa Brura is a, whenever I come up and encounter it in, in the morning tefillah, I'm, I'm brought right back to that, to that Safa Brura. I mean, that, 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 you know, clear. Someone had brought that in at that, in that, in that first encounter. Someone had brought in Safa Brura. Yeah. Not yeah. you. David Roskies. David Roskies. Yeah, yeah. I remember particular David Roskies. Safa, you know, yeah. No, I, 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 I was done. I, I was not leading it. Right. Um, many people have pointed to the creative tension between tradition and innovation, including a use of a very eclectic array of sources, Jewish and non-Jewish, um, in the course of Tfilot at Chavrat Shalom. Can, can you think of any examples of how other traditions and sort of experimentation that, that worked or that didn't work for that matter? With other religions, I don't. Or not religions. They might have just other non-Jewish sources. Might have been poetry, music, all kinds of things. Well, cer certainly, neo-Hasidic stuff was. I mean, that that was like our basic texts were, you know, kind of the Hasidic stuff that uh, that art really was introducing. Mm -hmm. Art and Zalman, particularly. So that came in 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 terms of music, presumably. And came in in terms of kavanot. It came in, in ter certainly in terms of study, and came in, yeah, definitely in terms of music. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
you know. I mean, the Hillel Levine was just a master of melody. And Bert, like I said, Bert uh, Jacobson. Um, Can you say a few more words about what Hillel Levine brought in terms of music? Well, he had like the whole Hasidic uh, songbook in his, in, in, his, uh, in his background. I mean, <clears throat> so... You know, sitting out on a Friday night, you know, he would be pulling these Ligonim from here and there. And and then uh, other people came, Nehemiah Paulin, you know, Nehemiah coming from uh, near Israel in Baltimore, brought some absolutely gorgeous melodies. And did some of these become melodies that were really familiar at... And, and and sung over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Roski's introduced the number. Um, uh, I mean, he he had Roski's also had kind of like the the theme song of of the Chavara was uh, the Kotsk song, you know. And th this was Ros Roski's introduction. So we would sing, you know, the Kotsk uh, song at every major occasion. What was the appeal of it? He sang it for us, by the way. Oh, he did? He oh, did. okay. So, but but, but what, what was the appeal? What, why was that so resonant? That's a good question. Um, I mean, partly it was that, you know, the Katsuka Rebbe was this enigmatic, you know, Hasidic figure, and, and, and so there was a great deal of kind of appeal to him, but, but also the song talking about kind of coming back to the to the essence felt like you know, that was defining what we were doing right. at a certain right. level. You mentioned that you wrote and introduced uh, a new song setting for Psalm 150. Right, right. Can you tell us about <laughs> that? So this, this ties back into Camp Ramah in a way. Um, so when I was uh, now a teacher at Camp Ramah in, 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 in 70, I, um, I brought something from my Camp Ramah experience in, in Canada to do these uh, two or three day kind of retreats. And so I did one in, in 70, and then they, they camp closed in 71, and then in 72, when, when I came back, <coughs> um, I was a teacher, and I, I led a um, kind of a three-day retreat. We, we went to a synagogue, actually, in, in Hartford. Um, well, the, the, the whole unit broke up into several different groups, but I took a group uh, to uh, on this uh, arts retreat, and the 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 focus of it was the last five psalms, which were all kind of musical or aesthetic instruments and sound, and, uh, um, and the each of the campers had a was charged with doing something with one of those psalms. Could do music, could do it in art, could do it in plastic, could do it in photographs, could do whatever, you know, pick a psalm, explore it, and come up with some artistic expression. So what was I gonna do while they were doing it? So I, I said, okay, well, I, I can. So uh, actually, I am one of, one of uh, uh, a camper, um, kind of strumming along, and did a new song setting for, for, Psalm, for Psalm 150. Tell and us about Psalm 150, just to start with, for those who are listening. 
Well, Psalm 150 is kind of the, the last psalm, and it's, um, it's uh, you know, praise God with a timbrel, and praise God with a drum, and praise God with the cymbals, and praise, you know, and the last line is, um, everything that has breath praises God. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I developed this, this song setting for her and introduced it, um, when I got back at, at, at the Havara. And the introduction for it, um, was, if I can still remember it, um, What is Hallelujah? Okay, so you know there's a there's there's a it, it's become a kind of a common teaching now that um, you know the the four letter name of God is unpronounceable. Well, there's an admonition not to pronounce it, but it's also unpronounceable, so the admonition is probably you know, beside the point. But that the closest that you can come to sounding it is, is breathing. So, um, so what is hallelujah? It's the four-letter name of God plus la-la-la-la-la. <laughs> So, uh, so that was the introduction, and the the song, the setting is, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. That was yours? Yeah. I grew up singing that every day. <laughs> See? <laughs> Not grew yeah. up, I mean, yeah. in my, those years. Yeah, yeah. The so worship, worship it, was, and study. it was introduced one Shabbat morning at the Chavara, and uh, through some mechanism that is totally mysterious, it became ubiquitous. So I've done a lot of things once. I wrote a, a short story that had divine inspiration once. I wrote a song once. I've written a, 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 another song more recently, but it's... What is not. that? What's the more recent song? Well, I've been, I'm, I'm particularly attracted to a verse that, ha that for some reason has never had a song setting to it, as far as I can, and, it, and it's, um, V'adonai lo yanum v'lo yishan amorer yishenim v'amekids near damim, that uh, God neither slumbers nor sleeps, God awakens the slumber, the, the, those who slumber and, and, uh, and kind of rouses those who are. And to me that always, the, the resonance of that is that, to me that, that's almost definitional. That is, God is the consciousness that is always awake. And for us, God's entrance into our life is to awaken us, to, to wake us up, to make us, to, to rouse us from con to, into consciousness. Um, and, and for me, staying awake is a kind of a mantra to kind of stay present, stay present. Yeah. So, 
this this is a I, I think a very resonant resonant verse. So I I developed a setting for it. It has not yet become ubiquitous, so that, <laughs> who knows? But it's. Um, Vadonai lo yanum, ay 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 velo yisham. Vadonai lo yanum, ay 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 velo yisham. Hamorer yishenim, ay 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 vameikit near damim, ay 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 hamorer yishenim, ay 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 vameikit near damim, ay 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 ay. Beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I want to talk for a minute about Torah readings um, and Divrei Torah during the course of the service. Um, uh, how would you, how would you explain how people approach the the question of uh, interpretation? Regarding the the weekly parsha and how it was presented within the chavara. All right, th this is not my long suit. I don't think I ever gave a dvar Torah or mm -hmm. at, at, at the chavara. I mean, the davening was okay, but you know. Um, so the the it was a it it it, it was always an exercise in um psycho-spiritual reflection on the meaning of Torah. And, and uh, the very best were um, combinations of, of poetry and intellectual brilliance that kind of converged. In, um, I mean, I still remember Joel Rosenberg, and probably heard, might have heard this a moment, but um, Joel Rosenberg did the um, the uh, the Devar on Mishpatim. So you know this is a catalog of laws, right after the Ten Commandments. Okay, you have the big drama of the Ten Commandments, and then the next week you have this catalog of laws, and. He reinterpreted it that, and, and, and classically, the narrative of the Bible stops here, you know, and then the rest of the Bible becomes either rep recapitulation or, or kind of elucidation of, of laws. And he reinterpreted that to show that each one of these laws was a narrative in and of itself, and he would draw the picture of the situation that led to that particular law and, and the, the, the interpersonal dynamics that were going on in the, the societal, the, and it, it was stunning as a, as a total reinterpretation and turning on its head you know, the classical understanding of what, of what this was. But it was done in such a beautiful, poetic fashion. So it wasn't just the intellectual, you know, brilliance of it, but the delivery itself was 
stunning and memorable. Yeah, yeah. Memorable. Let's talk for a minute about gender and uh, the role of gender, um, specifically the issue of women's roles in the context of, of public worship. Um, how, how would you describe the attitudes towards women's participation in public worship at the time that you were involved? This was early. It was before the formation of Ezra Nashim in 71 2 and the sort of early feminist uh, gatherings that took place in New York, 73, those, in those early years. So this is early on, just, but just before that, just before the ordination of the first woman, et cetera, in 72. Well, again, and given that, that the Havara was set up as a seminary at a time when, when and particularly around the draft, um, the, the people who applied and, and were accepted were men. Um, and that was kind of taken for granted. I mean, <laughs> it was just the way it was. I'm, um, no one was objecting to it and, and, and um, as, as time went on and, and women started entering into the rela relationship, or men started entering into relationships with, with, with women, the women started becoming part of the, the fabric of the community, they were accepted into the fabric of the community. I mean, that, that, there was very little issue about that. And certainly from the very beginning, um, Kathy Green was kind of yeah. you know, full partner in, in the enterprise. Um, and uh, women were uh, took classes. I mean, any of the classes that we were taking, women women were taking. Um, were they taking any roles in in during services? Uh, not initially. Maybe in total reading, I don't know about but not in leading services, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure about Divre Torah, I don't think so. Do you remember anybody wearing, any woman wearing a tallit, kippah? Yeah, I don't think that was, that, I don't think that was an issue. I think, I think we may not have been an issue, but was anybody doing it? Or was, or was it just before? I can't really remember, but I, 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 I would mm -hmm. be surprised if there weren't women wearing tallit. Because again, Zalman's presence here was 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 profound, and Zalman was kind of the one who kind of broke out the talus from its black and blue and white stripes, you know, and kind of introduced it as a article of personal expression. And and um, what was his talit like? Well, Zalman introduced the bene or talus, which was kind of the multi-color. Stripes. stripes and blacks based on the spherotic chart, you know, and um, but he also had Paisley, Talesim, and you know, and whatever, you know. So I, 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 I'll even go as far as yes, women were wearing Talesim, and that, or some at least were wearing. Um, what about counting women in a minion? Okay, so I remember the exact time when we <laughs> let's see if this jives with, with what others remember. So we were on a retreat and one of the women one of the women was saying Kaddish and we didn't have a minion of men and she got up and said, and I believe it, it was either Mona Fishbane or Eva. Eva Epstein, I think, mm -hmm. um, who said, I'm going to say Kaddish. And we all looked at each other and said, 
okay. You know? That's, and that was it. And from that point on, women, that's an issue of, of counting it on. In, in other words, we didn't go through this long deliberation and you know, investigation of halacha, and it was just obvious when it was pointed out. And then it wasn't an issue anymore. Now that was in terms of counting women in the minion. Do you have a sense of when that was? Well, it had to either be in my second or third year. I don't think it was in the first year. So it was either 71, 72, or, I mean, 70, 71, or 71, 72. But in terms of a woman being a member, that was an issue when Ruby Flashman um, I guess broke up with I forget who she was going out with. But anyway, she, she had been part of the community and then they broke up, and she said, I'm still part of the community. And that, that raised a lot of questions. Wasn't, then that, that became part of a deliberative process. But the end result of it was, yeah, she was. And then we started accepting women. And I believe that Michael and Sharon Strasfeld were the first couple, they were then a married couple, who were both members of the couple had to be accepted individually as members. So that was in that, that could period be. too, yeah, right that, in, that, in the early 70s. Well, that was probably in uh, 70, um, 71. I think so. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Why do you think the minion question was so easily resolved and other issues required more deliberation? And were there any other issues that required deliberation, whether it was women giving divrei Torah, women giving... No, I mean, once, once women were... Once, once the issue came up and issue of women's participation, then I don't think there was any, mm -hmm. any question about, mm -hmm. well, what about this, what about this, what about this? I mean, then, then it was just a question whether anybody wanted to do it. I mean, you know, the, the stakes are very high, you know, right. and so if, you, if you're going to be the first woman to be davening at the, at, at the Chabra, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, I want to ask you briefly about um, the role of, of learning and, and study for you, classes within the Chavara, and then I want to get to the Jewish catalog. Okay. okay. So, um, what, what was the role that Chavara envisioned for um, study and learning? How, where did it, where was it situated in relationship to tefillah and sort of other social action, for instance? It was in between tefillah and social action. So the greatest emphasis was on tefillah and the least emphasis was on social action and kind of a, it, everybody was expected to be, to be learning. Um, and learning in classes at the, at the Chavara. Um, so um, Uh, whether that it was a full course load, as it were, or, or not, um, but I think everybody was engaged in some, some type of learning. Mm -hmm. and, and the learning covered the gamut. I mean, I, I learned whatever Talmud I know from, well, I began, I mean, when, when I went to the seminary, I, I yeah. learned more, but I mean, I got my basis in, in Talmud. I, at the Chavara, and we also learned Hasidic texts with art, and studied uh, Job with uh, with Bazi and. Uh, and Everett, what? 
what was his the area that he was most instrumental in conveying to you? You know, I, I'm sure that I studied with, with Everett, but, but, I, but I really learned from Everett. I learned down in the fields. I mean, I, I used to go out to his, his house where they had basically a farm, and I would just work alongside him in the fields, covering the blueberries and, you know, picking the corn, and, and I would, that's how we would learn, how I would learn from him. So I'm, I'm sure that we studied text, but what I really learned from, from Everett was much more about mm -hmm. kind of the holiness of nature. Um, so we just mentioned social activism. Where would you say so social, what role, what place did social activism have within Chavarat Shalom? Well, it was a principle and it was, it was one of the pillars, but it was, it was observed in the breach more than in the reality. Um, there was a, um, there were, there were a group of Havara members who, who took it very seriously and, and created a major, kind of, or major, created a kind of a, a real community outreach um, unit called Brook and Power, Heat and Power, Brook and Power. I haven't heard about that. What is oh, it? Oh, really? Oh, the, the, it was uh, Brookline uh, Heat and Power. Uh, it was a little storefront that uh, was like a community organizing uh, base uh, for uh, underprivileged kids in, in, in the, the, the Brookline area. And we were all supposed to take turns participating in it. And, and it was all run by the Chavara? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but by a few people. <laughs> and and how, long did that, how long did that go on? Yeah. You don't know. Okay. Um, so Brooklyn Light and Power. Is that in Brooklyn Light and Power? Yeah, not Heat and Power, Light and Power. So as we mentioned, um, in your second year at the Havara, um, as I guess it was becoming apparent that the seminary was not going to be a reality, it wasn't going to become a path. At any rate, you decided to go pursue a master's degree at Brandeis. That's right. So yeah, I wanted to. Um, I felt I I should have kind of a, an academic credential. What happened to the rabbinate at that point? Well, that wouldn't necessarily be an academic credential. That would be. So this might have been in addition to rabbinic yeah. ordination. Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't doing this. I was still intent on on getting uh, on going through the program, but. Um, But there was a program at the time, Contemporary Jewish Studies, and um, it uh, seemed like a good adjunct to what what we were doing. And um, it was its focus was was its focus on Jewish communal service at that point. No, no. Mm -hmm. What was it? It. <laughs> no. Damn if I know. Um, it was. Um, <clears throat> It was an academic program looking at uh, primarily the contemporary Jewish experience, and um, so it was more sociological. But I was also in the education track, so uh, it was a, a way of kind of, I guess, building up my uh, education uh, bona fides. Okay, so you had to write a master's thesis for this okay. program, and this something that's had tremendous ramifications in your life it, and it, many other it people's has, as well. It, it, so tell us about how uh, the moment you came up with the idea for the Jewish Whole Earth Catalog. Yeah. Well, it actually began, the, the moment was in my first year. Hmm. Um, there were uh, you know, 20 of us out in the backyard trying to figure out how to put up a sukkah. And you know, as I say, it, it, bunch of, of Jewish guys who, who didn't know which end of the hammer to use, you know. Um, and and, and I, I said at the time, I said, uh, you know, there should be a Jewish whole earth catalog that you look into and you get instructions on how to build a sukkah, you know. And uh, we all said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> 
Um, now, the, the Whole Earth Catalog, the Whole Earth Catalog, you described as your Bible at that point. Yeah, I was very enamored of the, the Whole Earth Catalog. I mean, it really caught the ethos of the counterculture as I, as I, I engaged with it, which is a kind of a reappropriation of, of the tools for living and kind of getting away from vicarious experience, whether it's in you know, building a house or, or building a sukkah. Um, and and the, the sense that, you know, we, we, we can be empowered to create the, the, the conditions of our, own, of our own life. We don't have to farm it out to experts or to, to others. And, and so, you know, it, it, it underlay lay the back to the earth movement you know, grow your own vegetables, till your own farm. You know. um, and, and it was also the spirit of what we were doing at the Chavarun. I mean, that, that uh, in spite of the fact that, that we were ostensibly a seminary, I mean, I think what we were saying is that, that Judaism is, is something that everybody can do, and you don't need to, you know, Farm it out to, to your rabbis to or your you know, teachers to, to be your vicarious Jews. I mean, you want the experience. You can have the experience, and so um, I mean, the opening line of, of the the whole Earth catalog is, "We are as gods, and we might as well get good at it." And that kind of summed it up, and, and you know, it was this, this magical compendium of tools and resources and books and people and um, that, uh, that, um, that enabled you to kind of construct a life however you wanted to, to do it, but, you know, using your own hands and your own ingenuity. So, the idea of a Jewish whole earth catalog was kind of wow. That sounds like a really I mean, because it was it was it was a manifestation of what we were doing. It was kind of an actualization or a, or a concretization of what of, of what we were doing. So that's where that's where the idea began. And and it, you know I, I started noodling it for for a while and, and began kind of working on it as it were and. It, you know, going over my papers, it, there, there's a lot of, there were a lot of manifestations. What, what, it, what was it called? For a while we were calling it Olam, um, or Mishkan, or, you know, to, to, and sent out no, letters to, to people all over the world. Wait, know. is this before, during, while you were writing this thesis, or is this, no, this no, is no, after this is that? before. This is before? Oh, before. yeah, 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 this, this is... This is the thesis was already two years later down the line, but okay. but there was a lot of um, a lot of preliminary kind of noodling and and. And you just said we. Who's the we? I mean, you and. Well, it was me and who el whoever else was interested in working on it. There, there, there wasn't a it wasn't a coherent. I remember Joel Rosenberg had a, had had a, a voice in it, and and um, I know we, we we were in contact with uh, the World uh, Union of Jewish Students, Widges, and kind of sent out a letter to them saying, "This is something we're thinking of doing. You know, who has ideas of what you think should go into it?" And um, start to get, you know. A, there was a conversation going around this, and no, when we got, when when we when we got to when I started the graduate program and we had to do a thesis, that seemed the idea of actually doing a thesis that would lay the kind of theoretical understructure for such a a book became became an idea. I mean, that didn't that didn't create the idea. That was the that was kind of the an opportunity to give it more reality than it had up up until then. Um, 
and uh, and George wanted to work on it, so we worked on it together. And again, he was also they, in the program. He was in, in, in the um, uh, CGS program too. Yeah, the two of us were were in it together. And again, it wasn't a very rigorous program. <laughs> there weren't a lot of demands in it, huh? and um, something like this was accepted as a thesis, even though it was. I'm I'm de I, I'm delighted that it was accepted as a thesis. It, it I've I've gone through it. There was actually some substance to it because we did some historical referencing and you know where where does it come from and you know um, what are the what are the values that were. What was it your intention even at that point to actually create this book, whatever it was going to be called? I mean, was that when did that become? A real reality for you. Well, it started to become a reality when we when we were doing the thesis, mm -hmm. and uh, we realized we needed to get if we were going to do this, we need to get serious about it. So, mm -hmm. we actually applied for a grant. And th this was the same time that the Institute for Jewish Life was created by the Federation Movement. The Institute was supposed to be a, um, a stimulus for creative ideas in the Jewish community. Unfortunately, it, it passed out of existence very quickly because the major spirit behind it, I forget what his name was, died oh. and it, it kind of fizzled. Um, but it did set up a, a grant process, and George and I applied to the Institute for a grant to hire a secretary who would help us kind of organize this increasing mass of material. Right? So um, in, their, in their wisdom, they didn't give us a grant, but they gave us a loan of $5,000 and we hired Sharon Strasfeld. In your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> to be our secretary. I see. So, uh, so, we, so we were working on it at that time and, and... Was this after you finished the program or while you were in it still? It was while, it was while I was in it. And um, so we started organizing. George decided to drop out because he wanted to go on to, to um, get his PhD. Sharon asked if her husband could join us. And I said, oh, sure. You know, it was very loose at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Why not? And, um, and then we began kind of, we took it to Shokin, the idea. And Shokin was quite interested in it. But at the same time, Chaim Potok, who was on the committee of the Institute for Jewish Life that gave us the grant, was also interested in it. So he also approached us about having JPS publish it. Mm -hmm. And then we got into this little rift between Shokin and APS, we, we were kind of not real um, experienced, obviously, in about the protocols of publishing. And, um, started negotiating with JPS after we had already received a contract from Shokin. We hadn't mm -hmm. signed the contract, but we had, mm -hmm. so that wasn't really quite kosher. So that's, that's kind of the development of it. So as you, as you mentioned, the Jewish catalog became its own phenomenon, and it really became the number one bestseller after the Bible of JPS. Still is. To this day, <laughs> yes. to this day. Why do you think this concept of, sort of do-it-yourself Judaism was so resonant, um, and for whom? Was it so resonant? 
Well, I think that it, it, it caught a moment in the, in the ethos. I mean, it, it, we, we thought we were writing it for us, right? We didn't know, we didn't know that anybody else would. But, but the, you know, as, as the whole Earth Catalog demonstrated, there were lots of people who were interested in this kind of reappropriation of the tools and resources of life to, 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 to empower and, 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 and revivify their, their, their experience and, and, mm. and reappropriating Judaism and Jewish life became, became a, um, you know, was a dimension of that. So I think that it, 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 it both expressed an ethos and it and it helped catalyze a uh, an ethos that was that was out there. So um, Jonathan Sarna, in a relatively recent uh, essay for My Jewish Learning, uh, credited the Jewish catalog with helping to move what he called the values and ideals of the Jewish counterculture from margin to mainstream. Yes. Um, where do you see the catalog as having had its greatest impact? As you look back over these decades, it was published in '73. I think that it uh, th there's several different levels on this. Okay, so, so part of it. It, it empowered, um, it, gave, it gave this whole generation growing up at, at that time um, the, um, it's not just the tools, but it, but it was an attitude that was expressed in it that um, Judaism doesn't have to be this stayed, boring, by the book, you know, fit, stay within the framework. Um, you know, we had stuff going on in the margins, right? We, we, we took it into a different dimension. Uh, it can be playful, it can be, and, and um, um, so I, I think that for uh, this whole generation that was looking for ways of kind of reappropriating the tools of living that and, and for whom Judaism was, uh, was, a, was uh, an important identity quotient, it, it, it was in some ways a lifeline. I mean, that's, I, that's how people described it to me. I think it was, it was very important for women. Um, many who wrote and said, you know, they did their bat mitzvah, their confirmation, and, and you know, kind of used this and, and kind of kind of broke out of, into a new creative space yeah. on it. So there was that, and that lasted for a long time. It also had an impact, interestingly enough, outside, totally outside of this culture, hmm. in, in other parts of the world. Um, we were on a, um, a, a congregational trip last year um, up the Danube, um, from Budapest to Prague and Vienna and um, wherever we went, uh, Laura and I would go into kind of the local reform shul or alternative minion and, and you know, kind of try to meet the people there and invariably on their bookshelf was Jewish catalog. And <laughs> It, it, it was, it was, um, it was incredibly moving. And when we, when we'd say, you know, you know, I wrote that, it's like, oh my God, you know. And they would say, you know, this has been, this has been a lifeline for us because where, where, where would they learn? Where would they, where would they learn? They, they don't have, they don't have, teachers or role models or so do you want to say something about 
did, did you find it in Poland also? Well, the, so we, we went to the Krakow Festival, which is this fabulous, the Krakow Klezmer Festival, you know. Krakow, thousands of people from, you know, all over Poland and actually all over the world come to Krakow for a Klezmer Festival every year. Um, so we're at the, 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 uh, the Klezmer Festival and um, we were told to, that we should meet with the, this couple who were um, instrumental in the, um, in, in the, 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 the Jewish underground under communism to kind of create a new Jewish spirit in, in, in Poland at the time. So we're, we're meeting with this couple, brilliant, I mean, very charismatic, very, very, very influential in terms of, of their impact on, on Jewish life in Poland. And, and I said, so, and they, they would meet in cemeteries because it was the only place they, they could you know, meet privately and they would have these stories. I said, so who, who did you learn from? What books did you use? How did, how did you? And she said, we had this book. I don't know if you've heard about it. <laughs> it's called the Jewish Catalog and everything was in it. And we learned everything. So, you know, I. I, 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 I didn't know what to say, so I, I was just kind of mute. Laura said, you know, he, he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so in some ways, I, I don't know how to evaluate it, it's in, but, but it was clearly not just, you know, 20-somethings, Counterculture or, or borderline counterculture Jews in America that were working for this thing. It it it, it touched a chord in 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 and people who were searching for their Jewish access to their the their, their Jewish substance in a in in a way that was totally unanticipated. What do we know? Nothing really. Nothing. We only have a little while left, so I okay. want to um, move to sort of the next stage of your life. The catalog was published in 73, and in the summer of 72, you left Boston and Kavarat Shalom and moved to New York to attend JTS. Were you intending to be in the rabbinic program at that point? I was in the rabbinic program. You were program. in the rabbinic program. Yeah, yeah. Um, just tell us briefly, what were your plans? What were you envisioning at that point? Well, I was still intent on becoming a rabbi, and, and since the Chavara wasn't able to, to do it, I, I decided to follow the path that most of my teachers hadn't gone to Jerry but knowing what they knew about, none of them had good experiences at JTS, although they all said that they got a good education, but the, the, the social, psychological, spiritual. spiritual experience was not so I, I insulated myself from the very beginning by joining the, the New York Chavara and actually becoming the, uh, the Shamash. I, you know, I lived in the Chavara. Um, and the Chavara in New York actually was in, a, in an apartment, a rented apartment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 98th, mm -hmm. Broadway 98th, yeah. And uh, so it was, a, it was like a two-bedroom apartment. I lived in one bedroom. It was a very big living room, which was a common room, and kind of a living room, dining room, and then there was another room where we would have classes and, 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 and other things like that. Um, yeah, and, and the two experiences were quite different. I mean, Boston was a very intentional community, very spiritual in its core, uh, very serious about its study. But, uh, New York was more... You know, the characterization is that Boston was this, the spiritual cover on New York was the intellectual cover on, and for Brangen was the political, you know. And that's not entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the um, 
the, the religious aspect of, of the New York cover up was not the, the, the major element by, by any means. Um, Services weren't regular, I understand, there. And they were... We, uh, it, not the way they were at Hubbard. No, Hubbard. not at all. And they weren't generally well attended. And you know, What was a, the heart of the New York Hubbard community in your experience? It, 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 it functioned more around um, kind of... Uh, The dominant image I have of the New York Havara was the retreats, which were a lot of very good study. I mean, we had some serious scholars here, David Sperling and Judith Plaskow and uh, David Ellenson, and, you know. Um, so, um, so the 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 the, the the learning component was was pretty substantial at the and and the social element i mean the the, the new york clavera in some ways still exists even though it doesn't because on rosh hashanah they have kind of and, and i don't know maybe on shavuos they get together for kind of holiday meals and mm -hmm. there's still a kind of uh, a, the original yeah the, the original, original yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, those early groups. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those members of the Chavara who were students or staff at either JTS or, or HUC, what did involvement in the New York Chavara re represent? What, what did it provide for its members that, that it's the seminary community did not? I think that's not really my my. Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really know how to answer that. For I think. You? I mean, oh, you mean I, I was part of the seminary? What? Yeah, you were part of the seminary. Oh, oh, of, oh. Well, it yeah. provided for me that you know the social, psychological, <laughs> and spiritual mm -hmm. dimension. I mean, I went. I, I went to seminary to to JTS for the courses. Mm. I mean, was that true of? Other, I understand that other members of the seminary, JTS and HUC, were members of the New York Chavara. There were both faculty and students from those institutions. Faculty? I don't know if there were any students. Other than you? Yeah. I think Jay Greenspan was, but he mm -hmm. dropped out. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any others. I mean, Russ Gay was, but he dropped out of there. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, when I was here, I was the only, I was the only, student. Right. I remember in my in my admissions interview, Gerson Cohen was the head of the committee, mm -hmm. and he asked me whether the chavara wasn't a violation of altifros minas tibur. You know, don't separate yourself from the community. And he said, don't don't you think that being part of this chavra is, is, is a separation from... Mm -hmm. No, it's like a shtibel. You go to your shtibel, I go to my shtibel. We're all part of the same community. <laughs> you said? I said that. You said? Yeah. Uh -huh. They let me Bobby in, so... <laughs> Jerry Serrata, they were all sort of NIC students at that time, no? Jerry was at HEC. Uh -huh. Yeah. And who else? Levy, tell me. Uh, Levy wasn't in the Chavara when I was. No, I don't think not so. when you were there. Yeah. Remeyerowitz. Meyerowitz, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to turn to our final sort of few moments, moments here to reflect a bit on, quickly, <laughs> on what what the Chavara and your experience within it has meant for you personally um, and your own the evolution of your career um, and, and more broadly as well. So 
after completing a master's, you went on um, to become a Hill director at Stony Brook, but then the bulk of your career was at the National Foundation, National Foundation for Jewish Culture, starting in 1978. Right, right. right. So I was um, there from 78 to 2006. What, what drew you to the National Foundation? Um, what did you hope to accomplish there? Well, when I was at Stony Brook, one of, the, one of my signal achievements there was to create the um, Long Island Jewish Arts Festival, which was one of the first Jewish arts festivals in the country, and it was really a spectacular event. We had speakers and performers and art exhibitions, and, and it, was, it was highly successful except on campus. It drew people from all over Long Island to, to the to the festival, students really couldn't care less about it. But, I mean, they did about some other things, but... Not really. And I, I, I realized then that there was a lot happening in the cultural arena about pushing the boundaries of Judaism and Jewish life and, and exploring Jewish meaning in, in forms from theater to music to literature, dance, that really were not being well distributed or, or, or encountered. And, and that, of, of all the things that I did at Stony Brook in those four years, that really was what, um, what got me energized. And I wanted to do more of that. So I started looking around for um, some opportunity to do something similar. So I, 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 ap <laughs> I applied for a grant. There was something at, the, at, at that time called the Radius Institute. I don't know if we've encountered this at all. Steve Shaw had created this really wonderful convening place for people who are doing new, um, new energy in, 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 around Jewish life. CAGE was created by the Radius Institute, as, as an example. Um, anyway, it's, it's Steve kind of embraced me in, within this, and I developed this idea for what I was calling at the time um, The Yuval Project, right? Yuval was the first musician mentioned in the Bible, and this was going to be basically an artist collective. And um, through Steve, I was able to get a grant of twenty thousand dollars from this philanthropist, Micha Taubman, who is this wild guy in and of himself, um, to uh, to basically underwrite the, the the Yuval Project, which meant to basically pay my salary. So I went to the National Foundation at the time, which had just announced that they were going to do a fund for the arts. And I said, well, who's running the fund for the arts? They said, we don't have anybody running. I said, what, what do you expect to happen? And we don't really know. We just <laughs> it was really crazy. They had, they had made this public announcement that they're going to do a fund for the arts, and they had not a clue what to do. So I said, well, I, I have, I have $20,000 to start a project in the arts. Um, you know, why don't you hire me to do that here? And they said, okay, that's, that's a good, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> really, this is, this is Emmis. And, and, and uh -huh. so I ended up with a desk and, and, uh, and something to do with, called the Yuval Project. And uh, that quickly, it didn't, it didn't materialize into anything very much. But meanwhile, I started insinuating myself in the, um, in the National Foundation. And I became the developer of uh, what, what became an increasingly large component of arts-related cultural activity. And, um, it, it, it was a bit of a struggle because the people who were in charge at that time really had 
no appreciation of the arts as a dimension of the Jewish experience. It was all scholarship and academics. Um, but well, where uh, did your own emphasis and, and sort of intense interest in, in the arts as a as a as well? I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, because I. So, so th this is this is where my experience in the Kabbalah, in, in a funny way, influenced what I was doing at, uh, because um, even though the, the culture and, and and religion are generally seen as as kind of a, opposite ends of the spectrum, right? You have the Yiddish secularists, and you have the you know the religious institutions on. Um, I didn't see that them as as poor. I, I saw I saw the kind of questions that were being asked by artists and the types of expressions and, and explorations that they were doing as very much a reflection of a spiritual quest and and a um, a way of kind of using Jewish language to to explore very deep. Um, levels of, of, of contemporary meaning and value. And so I didn't see them as, as opposites. And, and I, I felt a lot of what I, I was there to do at the foundation was to really see that, that, that it, it kind of expose the, these deep levels of artistic expression as in a sense, a spiritual search. And did that seem to you as a, a, an outgrowth, at least for you personally, of the kinds of exploration and sort of spiritual seeking that you had been engaged in up through the Chavarot that you were involved in? Yeah, in a funny way. I mean, it, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't, wasn't linear, but... Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at, from that short story that I, I wrote in, in college for Zalman, or the, the setting to Psalm 150 that I did at the Chavarah, I mean, these, are, these were art, artistic expressions as much as anything else. And, you know, it, it was just the form that, that they took. And, and um, so, so I, can, I can draw the thread, even though, you know, I, I didn't. Yeah. What was your involvement, if any, in the evolution of the uh, what became known as the Chavara movement? Did you were you involved in that at all? No, I wasn't. Because I I, 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 I was never particularly political. I mean, political in a small p sense. So I. And and I, I just found what what was going on in these different places was so so diverse. I really didn't know what what was the the underlying ethos that would that would bind together. No, I, I didn't. You mentioned that you had a, a disagreement with Art Wasco. I remember in the in over the, this question. Yeah, I mean, we we were on a retreat together at some point, and he was he was very intent on on trying to galvanize. A, a Chavra movement, and and I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my my head around it, and and we, I mean, it wasn't disagreeable. I mean, no, we, we, no, but I but we just, you know, it, it, it just didn't agree. So when you look back at the Chavra's vision of community and social justice and prayer and learning, what would you say? Have been its were its greatest strengths and its longest lasting sort of impact. Well, in, in a certain level, its greatest impact has been the people that were most influenced by it. I mean, it's. Uh, it's a, it's a litany of, of people who, who are now leaders in, in Jewish community and 
all sorts of ways from leading religious community to leading academic institutions to Russ Gay being the head of the New York Federation, for God's sake. I mean, that was, who would have thought? Um, Your role in the arts. My Your role in the arts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so, so there, you know, there, I, I think, I think the, the people that have, that have come out of it, that have been, in, in some sense, had their identities shaped very much by that experience is probably its major impact. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether that's where you want to go, but I, I'm, in, I'm involved with something now which, although it looks very different, I, I feel in some ways is, is a maturation of that, that vision or that experience that I, mm -hmm. that I had 40 some years ago. So we're, we're now involved in trying to create a, a synagogue-based village. Um, villages are now being created all over the United States as, as social rubrics for, to facilitate people to age in place. You know, most baby boomers, 85% of baby boomers want to continue to live where they're living. They don't want to move into senior communities and they don't want to go and create um, intentional, you know, kind of communities elsewhere. They, communities. yeah, they they want to they want to live in the homes where they're living now, but they need they need support systems to kind of provide um, to provide both social capital and to provide um, some social service as they as they get older and 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 have have different needs and. So what we're trying to create is really the first synagogue-based village. And who's the we? The we is is my wife Laura Geller and and um, um, a group of people both at Temple Emmanuel in Beverly Hills and Temple Isaiah, two two reformed synagogues in L.A., who have come together to kind of create this this initial village, and. Um, one of the one of the principles of the village that I've been really insistent on is that everybody who's part of the village makes a contribution to the village, not just financial, but of time and energy, and that part of being part of the village is helping to build the village. So whether it means running a program or taking somebody to the doctor or working in the office, um, or serving on a committee, or making phone calls to, to, to members to check up on how they're doing, that everybody, everybody has a responsibility to help build that co the, the community. So, in a way, this is like the Chavara grown up. We are, we are building an intentional community. And we're all responsible for putting the energy in, and to, and to, and to benefiting by the the resource that, that we're, we're 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 creating. So, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily my intent in doing it, but the more I reflect on it, the more I see the that this this is a this is a a through line. One last question is that you and, and Laura are also engaged in writing a book. Yes. Which also feels like in some ways, uh, <laughs> as you said, a bookend um, uh, to the, the Jewish catalog. Can yes. you just say a few words about the book that you're working on? Right. Well, as, as we were moving into our mid-60s, um, and I, I, I've now retired two years ago, Laura retired recently, but as we were kind of contemplating this, um, it occurred to me that, that it would be good to have a resource similar to, to the catalog, the way that the catalog provided some kind of guidance at this, at this stage of life to, to, empower, to kind of self-empowerment that 
we're now going into a new stage of life. It's uncharted territory. It's really uncharted territory. I mean, people have gotten, have, have become this old before, but we're, we're looking at health provided, um, you know, 20, 30 years. This is a new phenomenon that we're, that we're going through. You know, in, in 100 years ago, the life expectancy was 47. Now the life expectancy is 79. We've added 32 years, not at the very end of life, but now. And where are the guides? Where is the whole Earth catalog to, for the tools that we need to empower our, our lives at, at, at this point? So I began thinking, well, okay, look, you know, this should be the next Jewish catalog. And we began thinking about this as the next Jewish catalog. So this um, is from a, from a Jewish perspective? Well, yeah. So, so we've been thinking about it as a, from, a, from a Jewish perspective. But um, as we've gotten into it, we've, we've started broadening it. Because we were able to do the Jewish catalog because the whole earth catalog existed. There's no whole earth catalog for this stage of life. So in a sense, we have to kind of, we, we would like to open up into that broader territory as well. So right now the book is called um, Getting Good at Getting Older. The sub, sub cat, subtitle, not quite sure. A practical guide based on Jewish wisdom is something that we're we're thinking about in that regard. So, um, so we'll see. We we we've we've um, we have a publisher. We have a publishing date in 2018. So so we'll see. 2018 will exactly match 50 years since the first Havara was Oh, that's founded. right, that's right. So in a way, it's coming full circle. That's right. Um, and a way of giving back once again. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. For you. Uh, and thank you so much, Rich, for this interview. Well, it's thank been really you. wonderful. Thank and, you. And uh, we really appreciate your making the time while you're here on the East Coast okay. to talk to us. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And as I, as I mentioned before, the cameras were rolling, but I think I want to preserve for, for posterity this would um, have been my mother's 101st birthday. Today, November 20th. Yeah. Many, and, many things. And like her that. macrame is still on the ark in the Kavrach <laughs> right. alone, which is still going in, yeah, right. uh, in Somerville, Massachusetts, and that was Laura. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Okay, and, thank uh, you.